It is awesome to be here. It's, I'm so grateful uh, for my spiritual family here in the SoCon Church. It's always amazing to come together to worship God. And I have so much vision for what God is doing right now in the SoCon Church. He is rewarding our faith, and he is blessing us abundantly. And um, I want to something today. Whoops, should I not be on that mic? You can hear me on this mic okay or not? Nope, can't hear me on this. We're okay? All right, I'm doing it anyway. In our, uh, in our struggle for spiritual formation, there's a lot of things that we address, a lot of things we focus on. I want to address one thing that's crucial for us to be stronger in Christ. And it's really a question. Are we seeking strength or safety? Do we want to be strong in the faith or safely in control? And it's very important that we address this. It's important that you know where you're at. Oh, I don't have it on. That would help. <laughs> do you want to shout or do you want to use the microphone that's given you? <laughs> you know, if you want to be safe, you don't need any encouragement for that. It's our default setting. We strive to be safe. We're obsessed with being safe. We always pray for safety. We don't pray for strength that often. We do, but we tend to be more obsessed about safety. When we feel like we're in control, we feel like we're safe. When we feel like we're out of control, we're not safe. And so we strive to be in control. So if you want to be safe, you don't need encouragement. But if you want to be strong in faith, now that's different. You're going to need a lot of encouragement to be strong in faith, to really step out in faith. And as it turns out, we've got to choose which one we want if we're seeking strength or safety. And as it turns out, it's a battle for your soul. Because we do have an enemy who's attacking us at every turn. It's a battlefield of the mind, of thoughts, of ideas, who we're going to be, our identity. And so, to be strong in faith, you've got to choose. You've got to choose courage over comfort. You've got to choose faith over fear. And you've got to choose strength over safety. Bottom line is, God's asking us to do some pretty radical things in following the teachings of Jesus. Jesus is the most revolutionary figure that ever walked the earth. His teachings literally turned the world upside down. And we, his followers, his disciples, have chosen to follow his teachings. We've actually said, Jesus is Lord, and we've, we've chosen to follow the teachings of Jesus. And maybe we've forgotten this, but the teachings of Jesus are pretty radical, and they're really challenging to do. And so we need encouragement. And so I want to start with Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews is a book written to Jewish Christians who are starting to slide back into legalistic righteousness that never brought them righteousness in the first place. But they wanted to identify with that. They thought that they'd be performance, they'd have better identity if they were performance-based, so they were slipping away from faith in Jesus and holding on to the old way. And so the Hebrew writers is encouraging them. And we know this verse, a lot of us have this memorized in Hebrews 3.12, where it says, See to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage one another daily. Encourage, encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. What is that deceitfulness? What sin is, is deceitful? Yeah. But verse 14 is important to understand the context. We have come to share in Christ if, indeed, we hold to our original conviction 
firmly to the end. Why do we need encouragement? Because sin can harden us, and what sin are we talking about? Verse 14 says, we've come to share in Christ if indeed we hold to our original conviction. So see, this is a clue to where we're going with this message about strength or safety. What is the sin here? It has to do with conviction. It has to do with our original conviction we had when we said, Jesus is Lord. And it was really exciting yesterday to see Elijah stand there and confess his faith. And he grew up in church, but he told me on the side, I hope it's okay if I share this, that he, you know, a little, little scared, a little nervous. And, and it's like, that's great, because this is a huge commitment you're making here to say Jesus is Lord. And yet he did it, and man, he was fired up. And he is fired up. And that's your conviction. That's your original conviction. Jesus is Lord. What is the big sin that can harden us? Probably not what you're thinking. It's not the Galatians 5 big sins. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and the like. We know that, don't we? Guess what? That's not the one that's going to harden you. So sin can harden. Those things can do that. But that's not the context here. The context is a refusal to hold to your original conviction that you had when, Jesus, when you declared Jesus is Lord. And when you say Jesus is Lord, it means you are not. And it means he makes decisions and you do not. And even though you want to do something, wait, is this Jesus or is this me? And even though you don't want to do something you need to do, is wait a minute, is this Jesus or is it me? And it's always a battle of who is Lord in your life. And as Americans, we have trouble with this because we live in a democracy. So we pretend in the church it's a democracy. And it isn't. It's a theocracy. Jesus is Lord. You submit, he's Lord. Boy, we don't like that because we're American. The pursuit of happiness. Verse 15 says, just as it has been said, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. And we're going there. We're going to study about this today. We're going to look at the rebellion. Who were they who heard and rebelled? Were they not all those Moses led out of Egypt? That's a clue. That's where we're going. We're going back 3,500 years. And with whom was he angry with for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies perished in the wilderness, and with whom did God swear they would never enter his with those who disobeyed? In what way did they disobey? It says, so we see that they were not able to enter because of their, what? Unbelief is disobedience. Unbelief is the whole context. It's not the Galatians 5 sins. It's not what you do. It's what you believe. Because what you believe controls what you do. But what you do may not make a difference on what you believe at all. And so we get things switched. We're focused on the wrong thing. We're focused on performance, who we are, what we do. It's like, wait a minute. What do you believe? Because that will define what you end up doing. So we need to go back 3,500 years to the time of the Exodus When they were asked to be strong, the Israelites were asked to be strong, and yet they what? They rebelled through unbelief. Now, what's amazing is God had just provided so many proofs of his power. Isn't that right? How many many plagues did he do on the Egyptians? Ten plagues. Amazing. I mean, incredible things. And then these slaves were freed, and they left Egypt with what? Gold, silver, they plundered the Egyptians. That's another miracle. It's a miracle that the Pharaoh let him go. He was forced to, but it was still a miracle. And then drama ensues. The Israelites are leaving Egypt, and they come to the Red Sea. What are we going to do? And then they turn around, and they see Pharaoh's army. No, and they panic. No, what's going on? And they're all scared, and God says, hold the staff out, and he parts the sea All the drama, the plagues, the plunder, pillars of fire, dramatic chasing armies, churning and parting of waters. 
And then they enter the waters, and then they're in the desert. What are we going to drink? And God provides water. What are we going to eat? And God rains down manna from heaven. And we want, we want meat, and God provides quail. And all they're doing is complaining, and God keeps providing. Miracle after miracle after miracle. And you know what? Their shoes never wore out. You have a closet full of shoes. Back then, you didn't need them. Just one pair. You say, no, I need many pairs of shoes. Their shoes never wore out. Their clothes never wore out. All this drama finally leading them to what? Why did God do all this drama? Does, do we really need the drama? He leads them to what? To a promised land. A land flowing with milk and honey. God said, this is my rest. I'm leading you from slavery to rest. Their identity had been in their slavery and God is saying your identity is going to be in your rest. Amen. You're going to lay down your arms and your labor and you're going to rest in me and rejoice and be awestruck by my love for you. That's God's creation. Amen. I wish it ended that way. So let's go to Numbers. Numbers chapter 13. We're going to do a lot of scripture today. I hope you're okay with on this. It's a lot of scripture, but there's a very important point that we're making, and I just couldn't do less scripture to make the point. So Numbers 13, verse 1, we're back 3,500 years ago. The Lord had led them out of Egypt, and now they're about to enter the promised land. Things are going to get really exciting. Numbers chapter 13, the Lord said to Moses, send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I'm giving to the Israelites. From each ancestral tribe sent one of its leaders. So at the Lord's command, Moses sent them out from the desert of Paran. All 12 of them were leaders of the Israelites. There were 12 because there were 12 tribes. They were all leaders of the Israelites. These are their names. And the, the, the Bible goes through the whole list of names. Ten of which of those names are hard to pronounce. Ten of which of those names you've never heard any children being named after. Nobody names their little boys after those ten names. And there's a reason for that. There are two names of the, of the 12, 10, nobody names their kids after those names. There are two that everybody names, not everybody was that. There, chances are there are people you know that are named Joshua and Caleb, right? And there are reasons for that. So the two, the 10, remember that. There was the 10 and the two. Verse 17, when Moses sent the 12 out to explore Canaan, he said, go up through the Negev and into the hill country. See what the land is like and whether the people who live there are strong or weak, few or many. What kind of land do they live in? Is it good or bad? What kind of towns do they live in? Are they unwalled or fortified? How is the soil? Is it fertile or poor? Are there trees in it or not? Do your best to bring back some of the fruit of the land because it was the, it was the season for the first ripe grapes. So they went up and explored the land. So Moses sent out a pre-war party of 13 top leaders, the top leaders of the nation, to survey the land for conquest. Why would he do that? To encourage them. They'd been in slavery for hundreds of years, and God has led them through this drama, 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 to this moment to show them the promised land, the land of rest, flowing with milk and honey. So he wanted to encourage them. He wanted them to see for themselves that God was leading them indeed into this land of milk and honey. It was right there. He wanted them to know it, not just by faith, but by sight. Look, I'm going to send your top leaders in there to come back and verify. Guess what? It is a land flowing with milk and honey. And, of course, there's another reason for this. He wanted to put a war plan together. I mean, smart people put plans together, right? So we're going to skip ahead to verse 23. When they reached the valley of Eshcol, they cut off a branch bearing a single cluster of grapes. Two of them carried it on a pole between them. Why? Because it was enormous. How big does a cluster of grape need to be for two men to have to put it on a pole and carry it? It's got to be pretty heavy. It's not backpack light. It's, it, anyway. They did it along with some pomegranates and figs. It sounds great. That place was called the Valley of Eshcol because of the cluster of grapes the Israelites cut out there because it was so impressive. At the end of 40 days, did you catch that? At the end of 40, 40, 40 is a big number in the Bible. At the end of 40 days, 
They returned from exploring the land. And how, what was the report? They came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community in the desert of Paran. They reported to them and to the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land which you sent us. And it does flow with milk and honey. And here is its fruit. And the people were elated. They celebrated. They were so excited. God is great. God is real. He led us out to this. And we're going to get to go into this. And you guys saw it with your own eyes. This is awesome. And they lived happily ever after. Huh? Why? What happened? God fulfilled his promise. They're right there. All they need to do is go in. What's going on? Boy, I wish it had ended there. But you know, they were people just like us. So what we're studying about today is actually us, by the way. You may think we're back 3,500 years ago, but it's actually a story about your life and my life. So unfortunately, it continues. Verse 28 continues. There's a huge but word, you know, that's... It's not a good word, but can be very toxic. Turns out there's a lot of them in this story. Here's one of them. But the people who live there are what? The sitters are? And? So? We even saw what? Yeah, those are the descendants of the giant people. We even saw descendants of Anak there, and the Amalekites live in the Negev, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites live in the hill country, and the Canaanites and Mosquito Bites live near the sea along the Jordan. <laughs> well, they know where everybody lived. Then Caleb silenced the people. He had to silence the people. Why? They were upset. Why were they upset? So what that they were big and powerful? We're talking about God here. Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, we should go up and take possession of the land. I love this. For we can certainly do it. Of course we can certainly do it. Who is on our side? Who is our God? Who defeated the Pharaoh's army? And then there's another, unfortunately, there's another toxic word here in the next slide, verse 31. But Caleb, oh, where are we? Verse 30, Caleb silenced the people. Okay, verse 31 is somewhere in there. But the men who had gone up with him said, we can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they explored. They said the land we explored devours those living in it. Really, how'd they make it out? The land we explored devours those living in it. All the people, all the people we saw are of giant size. Really? The Amalekites, the Jebusites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Canaanites, really? There was one group of people that said they saw some of these people somewhere. And yet they're saying all the people are of giant size. We saw the descendants of Enoch there. Ooh. We seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes. And we look the same to them. Why didn't they get squished? At the ranch in Montana, when we saw grasshoppers, what did we do? Oh, that, I know, that's very violent. I'm sorry, maybe I offended you. But we had too many of them, I'll tell you that. And they were eating the crops, and that wasn't good. And that meant money, and so we squished grasshoppers. Yeah, well, anyway. But they didn't get squished. Chapter 14. That night all the members of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. God leads them out of Egypt, out of slavery. He brings them right to the promised land. They see it. They verify it. And they're weeping. They're crying. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron. Because we always take it out on somebody. And the whole assembly said to them, If only we had died in Egypt. Or in this wilderness, why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, we should choose a leader and go back to Egypt, back to slavery. 
Back to slavery, back to the security of slavery, back to the safety of the known. So, well, better the devil you know. It's still the devil. It's still slavery. Then Moses and Aaron fell face down in front of the whole Israelite assembly gathered there. Joshua and Caleb, the two who were among those who explored the land, tore their clothes and said to the entire Israelite assembly, the land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey and give it to us. Only do not, what? Rebel. Do not rebel against the Lord. Do not be afraid of the people of this land because we will devour them. So the ten are saying, the ten kept spreading everybody. We're going to get devoured by these giant people and all that. Caleb and Joshua are saying, we're going to devour them. Do not be afraid of them. The Lord is with us. But the whole assembly talked about stoning them. Wow. That's what fear does. Stoning the people that brought the good news. Stoning the people that said, God is great. God can do this. Let's make this happen. And it's like, I don't want to hear that message. Kill those people. I want my security. I want my safety back in Egypt. I'm finding somebody to take me back to my slavery. Remember the stories about us. It's easy to criticize them. Let's get the application for us today. It says, then the glory of the Lord appeared. Oh, that's great. The glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of meeting to the Israelites. The Lord said to Moses, how long will these people treat me with what? Contempt. And we're going to revisit that word. That's an important word to remember. How long will these people treat me with contempt? How long will they refuse to believe in me? In spite of all the signs I performed among them. It's so sad. God's heart is breaking. How can this be? After all I've done, after all the signs I have performed, how can they be refusing to believe in me? Finally concluded, well, I'll strike them down with a plague and destroy them, but I'll make you, the two, into a greater nation and stronger than they. I guess I have to start over. I guess I just have to pick a new Abraham. A couple Abrahams to rebuild my nation because this nation has blown it. They see all this. They don't believe it. The nation is in crisis. Sky is falling down. The people are in rebellion. God said, enter the blessed land that I prepared for you. And they said, we can't. What is the truth? Could they have entered? Could they have? Absolutely. They just refused. They were scared. They gave in to fear. The truth is, God is God. And if God says it, we can do it. And if God says he's with you, he is with you. And if God says you can change, you can change. And if God says you can do something radical, you can do it. If God sends you, go. If he tells you, make it happen. But it's so hard. I'm so scared. But God is God. The truth was absolutely they could have entered. But they gave in to their fears. Fear causes us to lose our minds. And when we lose our mind, we we cling to lies. We trust lies that Satan gives us. You can't. You can't. It's too hard. You're too scared. You're not the guy. Look at how you've blown it. You you loser. And we believe the lies. We believe Satan's identity for us rather than God's. We refuse to trust God's way because we've lost our minds. It's so frightening, we say. We desperately seek the safety of our control. Who do we trust? In Jim, I trust? Really? In Jim, I trust? No. I mean, I know more. I know me better than you know me. I don't trust me. 
I don't trust you. Why are you trusting you? Why are you trusting your analysis rather than God's? There's a critical conviction that we have to have here. It's not so much about what we are doing. It's about who we are trusting. Because what we're doing is simply a reflection of who we are trusting. And it becomes a judgment on God. It becomes a judgment on who you believe God is. Is God God? We'll continue in numbers here. As surely as I live and as surely as the glory of the Lord fills the whole earth, God said, not one of those who saw my glory and the signs I performed in Egypt and in the wilderness, not one of those who have seen the miracles of God. Remember, we're talking about us. We're talking about us. Not one of those who have seen all these miracles that I performed but have disobeyed me. What is disobedience? Refusal to believe. Disobedience is not the Galatians 5 stuff. Disobedience is refusal to trust and believe God. Not one of those who disobeyed me and tested me ten times, not one of them will ever see the land I promised on oath to their ancestors. Not one who has treated me with contempt will ever see it. I weep. And they had to spend 40 years realizing they blew it. 40 years wandering in the desert. They turned from trusting God in his way and they chose safety over courage, fear over faith. And God calls that contempt. The 10 panicked, spread lies to all the people to reject the promise of God. They wanted to stone the faithful too and go back to their familiar life of slavery. Take us back to the comforts of slavery. How's that going to work out for you? Why, why did God make it so dramatic? Why was it so hard? I don't know. I mean, that's how God rolls. I mean, it helps us. It builds our faith. Contempt is a, is a strong word. Let's, let's visit that word here for a second. Let's throw up that slide. Contempt, the feeling or attitude of Regarding someone as inferior or base of worthless, God said that when they refused to believe and refused to trust him despite all that God had done, what did God say that was? Contempt. So basically God is saying, I have become a worthless enemy of your happiness and security. Wow. That's a tough one. They knew God could do it. They saw God do incredible miracles. But they said, no, you're now a worthless enemy. You're not telling us what we want to hear. Life is tough. You're going through major challenges right now. Every single person here is in battles. And these battles are not light. They're, they're, the Bible says light and momentary troubles. They don't feel that way. They feel like major, major battles. Some are going through major financial battles, major relational conflicts maybe, major, major problems at work. It could be anything. Fill in the blank. You know what your issues are. You know what they are. God is leading you to this edge of promised land to trust him, to enter his rest, enter his security. Jesus said, take my yoke upon me and learn from me and you will find what? Rest. He didn't say, take my yoke upon me and you'll find work. Take my yoke upon me and you'll find worry. Take my yoke upon me you'll find stress. No, if we have worry and stress and all those things, you got the wrong yoke. Jesus said, come to me and you'll find rest. When we, we know we found Jesus when we find rest for our souls. Despite the turmoil, we will always have problems. We're always going to have conflicts. But we got to go to Jesus. Oh, this is hard to talk about. I hate talking about this stuff. Oh. I've gone through so many periods of chronic pain. And if you've gone through chronic pain, or you're in, there are many people here that are in chronic pain. If you've gone through chronic pain, you can relate to this because people don't see it. You feel so alone. Like if you have a broken leg and you're limping, people open doors for you. You go in with chronic pain, people expect you to be normal. It's hard. I remember one time my daughter, this was years ago, I think she was still in high school, I was going through 
massive amounts of chronic pain, years of chronic pain, and I didn't want to live. And I was, I was literally praying to die. I literally was. And she goes, but dad, God is honoring you. I'm like, I don't want the honor. I don't want the honor. Take the honor. I don't need it. Because it's tough when you're going through major issues. It's so hard. You just want to be left alone. You just want God to take care of it and you not to do anything. But God is calling us to be strong. And the pathway to spiritual strength is rarely safe. It's fraught with danger, full of risk. It leaves our legs shaking. So I'll tell you a story I don't like to tell. It's hard to tell. <sighs> okay. So it's Africa. We used to street. Uh, I, I helped plant the church in uh, Nairobi, Kenya. Um, I was there three years. And the first we were, year we were there, we wanted to take the message out to as many people as possible, as quickly as possible. So we did street preaching. It was illegal to do it officially, but we just decided we're going to trust God and do it anyway. So I'm not saying it was the smartest thing to do. It's just what we decided to do. So we would go out and street preach in downtown Nairobi, and we'd get huge crowds. When I say that, like 200 to 300 people every single time. So I was the main guy preaching. I'd go out there, and I'd do this message, and, we'd, and then we'd break up. After the message, all the disciples would be scattered among the crowd, uh, strategically, and then they'd turn and clump people together and say, would you like to hear more? And they'd have a Bible study right on the spot. They'd study out what the, the Word of God, or they'd study out discipleship, and they'd have these, like, these little Bible talks. This is all during the lunch hour. I'd preach for maybe 15 or 20 minutes, and then the rest of the time was little, uh, little Bible talks. And so we grew, it grew. It grew pretty big. Uh, one of the guys that got baptized from that, I'll just call him Thomas, um, he said at his baptism, he goes, my mother's really upset about this decision that I'm making to follow Jesus. And we're like, no, you got to trust God. It's going to be okay. And, uh, you know, I didn't put any thought past that. I mean, it's tough for a lot of our families, right? When we suddenly make Jesus Lord and, you know, anyway. So I'm out street preaching, and then all of a sudden this woman comes up to me and starts screaming and hitting me with her umbrella and already a crowd of about 200 had gathered because, you know, we did this every day. And she's hitting me with her umbrella and screaming that I had kidnapped her son, that I was making him a slave, and I was taking him back to America as a slave to be my personal slave. And she was screaming in like three languages. I understood the English, I halfway understood the Swahili, and I wasn't getting the Kikuyu at all. But what happened was the crowd believed her. And so they crushed in. And so all of a sudden the crowd rushed in. And everybody was upset and they were arguing and they were yelling at me. And then some people were defending me, but most people were yelling at me. that the, I had, They were believing her. And I had no idea who this woman was. I was trying to get away from her. But the crowd said, oh, no way. And in Africa, they got this thing called mob justice. And if the crowd decides you're guilty and they, they kill you, they stone you, or they beat you up or whatever, the crowd is right, right? Nobody's, so I'm looking for help. I'm like, they're, I can't leave. They're crushing me in with this woman yelling at the crowd. And I, I, I'm trying to say something, and I can't because the crowd is crushing me in. And I'm looking for help. I'm looking for police presence. The police are there, but they're doing nothing. I'm looking for the disciples. I can't find any of them. The crowd grew to what they said was about 500 to 600 as this woman's yelling. My legs are shaking. I am terrified out of my life. That's the only time, well, twice, that I have truly believed I was dead. All I could do is just trust in God. I said, God, I don't know what to do. I can't say anything. I could barely, I could barely think. I thought my life is over. This is it. Because they were so upset. Then suddenly the big hands grabbed me from behind, and I'm like, oh, this is it. And I looked up, and I recognized that the, the, this, this, it's a huge guy, 6'6", six, six and like 250 pounds, a massive guy. His name is, uh, is McDeck. And I looked at him, and I thought, McDeck, I've been studying the Bible with this guy. In fact, we were supposed to count the cost with this guy today, but he looked really upset. And I'm like, this is it. I guess he turned on me too. This is it because he's, you know, he's huge. And so my legs are shaking, and he's upset. But he starts yelling at the crowd that they're wrong. And he's so big and his, his voice is so loud. 
And he's so demanding. And this guy's a gentle giant. I mean, I'm like, I'd never heard the guy say anything louder than this. In all our Bible studies, he was like this the whole time. And I'm like, this guy's yelling. And he didn't pretend that he was on my side at all. <laughs> but what he did was he got the crowd convinced that we were going to work it out. The woman and he, he was going to be a, a judge. And we were going to work out whatever this issue was. He didn't know who this woman was either. Time to turn out the woman was Thomas, Thomas's mother. And it was a misunderstanding. And we worked it out. The crowd allowed us to leave and work it out. She never apologized. She just grumble, grumble. Okay, he's not a slave. You're not taking him to America. And she left. And then the crowd dispersed and everything was okay. I, 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 I said to him, I said, you really want to become a Christian? We were supposed to count the cost today. I said, I'm ready. Let's get baptized. I'm like, did all that happen so that he would count the cost? <laughs> What is God after in your life? What's he looking for in your life? Performance? Legalistic righteousness? Or is he looking for faith? Go to the next slide, Paul. Oh, did I, did I miss, mess something up? No, I didn't. What is God looking for? I want Paul's quote out of Galatians 5, 6. It's the last slide. There we go. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. We think so often the only thing that counts is a righteous life. The only thing that counts is a pure life. The only thing that counts is a good life. The only thing that counts is a be, be a good person life. This doesn't say any of that. The only thing that counts is faith. Because faith makes you righteous. Expressing itself through love. In other words, an active faith, a faith that changes you, a faith that changes your environment, a faith that changes the people around you. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. What do you believe God really is upset about your life over? Do you think He's really upset about your sin, about your murder, impurity, dissensions? What do you feel guiltiest about? God isn't looking at that stuff, He's looking at your faith. Because with faith, you can do anything. Our identity is not in what we do. Your identity is not in your age. It is not in your gender. It is not in your race. It is not in your job. It is none of that stuff. Your identity is in Jesus. We are all in Jesus. The big sin that will harden your heart is not murder or impurity. The big sin that's going to harden your heart is contempt, refusing to trust God, refusing to believe God, refusing to step out in faith and make a difference with your life. I pray every day, God, use me, make me, mold me. Is that a scary prayer? Yeah, it is. That's a scary prayer. Sometimes I don't want to pray it. I'm like, but I don't want you to do anything dramatic. <laughs> what am I trying to say today? I'm not trying to tell yourself to beat yourself up over your lack of faith. I don't want you to walk away with that. I don't want you to leave here discouraged. I don't want you to leave here saying, man, I lack so much faith. I'm a loser. I don't want, I, that is not the point. I want to encourage you to change your focus, to change your identity, to change what you're thinking about. Don't think about things that paint you as a loser. Think about your identity in Christ. You are chosen. You are loved. You are a child of the living God. Jesus living in you. You've been crucified with Christ. You no longer live. Christ lives in you. He lives in you by faith in the Son of God who loved you and gave himself for you. That is your true identity. What impresses God is not a sinless life, but a courageous, faithful one. A powerful life lived through conviction in God's spirit. What is God asking you to be strong in today? What giants are you facing today? Maybe God is asking you to have faith and courage to forgive someone. Maybe to serve more. Maybe to sacrifice more. Maybe it's to step up to the plate and lead your family spiritually. Maybe the giants you are facing is taking a stand at work and refusing to compromise your faith. Maybe it's enduring severe trials in your life by trusting the story. Maybe it is purity. Maybe it's having the courage to share your faith with those you meet. 
Maybe it's deciding to be super encouraging in the fellowship. Maybe it's trusting the grace of God in your life, truly believing how much God loves you, truly trusting how much you've been forgiven. Maybe it's seeking advice and help from others when you don't want to. Maybe it's taking new responsibility, taking on new responsibilities in the church when you have so little time and see God multiply your loaves and fish. I want to remind us, remember, remember the times in your life that God answered your prayers. We could all put up our hands. God has answered our prayers. God has done miracles in our lives. Remember where God did these miracles. Remember the answered prayers. Remember your faith stories where you stepped out in faith and it worked. Remember how God has worked in your life in so many cases, even unexpected cases. Remember how God has changed your character, changed your heart, and changed your desires and helped you repent of sin. When you choose to believe, you see miracles. When you step out in faith, you see God do great things. God blesses it. Faith blessed. Faith blessed. Strong in faith blessed. God is looking for that just to bless you. God will amaze you as you step out in your faith. And you use your faith. God is so creative. So don't give up the fight. I'm so weak. I feel weak. That's okay. It's okay to be weak. But you can overcome. Just don't refuse him. You can wrestle, you can struggle, you can complain, you can yell at God, but just believe. Always believe. Let's encourage one another in the fellowship as we ask each other, well, what takes you, brother, what takes you a lot of faith? Sister, what takes you faith today? Because we can be so encouraging. Teresa and Mackenzie are going to come out and sing a song, When You Believe. It's from the Prince of Egypt. The lyrics are perfect. God has great vision for you. Amen. It's not to be a professional Christian. God's vision for you isn't to just study your Bible and read and pray and come to church. Amen. It is not that. God's vision for you is to be a man of faith and conviction, a woman powerful in trusting God, stepping out and seeing God do great things in your life. That is God's vision for you. You didn't get baptized to come to church. You got baptized that God would work in you and do great things. I have so much vision for this spiritual family. We can do this. Choose faith. Be strong. Choose trust. And never, never, never back down. Amen. We needed that, right? Um, I just thank you, Jim. I'm sure we're all reflecting on how we can all be more faithful. And he asked us to sing this song from the Prince of Egypt. But, you know, to me, it's a miracle. And uh, one of the God's miracles is that my daughter is baptized and up here singing with me. So this is an example right here. <laughs> Lots of prayers for years. Anyway, so um, let's think about the words to this song and let it inspire us a little bit more. Many nights we prayed with no proof anyone could hear. In our hearts a hopeful song we barely understood now we are not afraid although we know there's much to fear we were moving mountains long before we knew we could oh there can be miracles when you is frail it's hard to kill who knows what miracles you can achieve when you believe somehow you
too swiftly flown away yet now i'm standing here my heart's so full i can't explain seeking faith and speaking words i never thought i'd say there can be to kill Who knows what miracles you can achieve when you believe somehow Can we start by giving it up for Jim for that amazing message and that beautiful song. We're going to end on that note, so we'll pray and then we'll go straight into fellowship. Uh, if you could all stand. Heavenly Father God, thank you so much for just how amazing you are. Lord, thank you for just the opportunities to go through trials and tribulations, God, to have a story to share with others that encourages their faith. God, we thank you so much for how you continue to show yourself, God. And we sit there and we look at the Israelites as their own separate case. But as Jim mentioned, we're all the Israelites, God. We do. We lose our way. We lose our faith. God, I pray that as we go forth in this week, God, as we go forth from this building, that we remember, God, the times that you have answered our prayers, that we don't lose sight of that, God, that we don't let that sin of contempt Grab us, God, that we can have faith in the ways that you have called us to, God, to where we were initially convicted when we said Jesus is Lord. Lord, we love you so much. We thank you when we praise you. And it's in your son, Jesus Christ's name, we pray all these things. Amen. Have a great time of fellowship.